A quick thank you to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Dark Machine, Try Again 95, Astray the Dreamer, Mezik, Udic Joel, German Chemist, Casper Arnholtz, and Chaos to Must. Thank you very much. Most Improper Yet Effective Warriors, written by Lords of Jupe. Seated in a council chamber, as was befitting her station, Lorwa, House of Upsen, matriarch of the third battle group in defense of the sovereign realms, stared in non-comprehension at the field reports provided to her by the most recently arrived recon unit. The report provider, Lieutenant Key of no house in particular, just an appendage to the sovereign realm's military, seemed remarkably relaxed for someone in the presence of a party of full eleven social degrees removed and above him. If anything, he seemed cheerful, which was far removed from the usual mood of someone delivering field recon notifications and reports. This, um, Lorwa said, tapping the data pad with an elongated and tapered finger, the gap of which was a cruel hook point, scoring a thin line of abrasion into the pad itself. Makes less than no sense. This is anti-sense. Logic has fled this device. I rebooted it six times and ran a spec scan, just to ensure that it was, in fact, showing the Sovereign's own linguistics encryption and not some sort of, uh, psychological trickery. She furrowed her brow, leaning in subtly across the desk, squinting at a deeply subordinate figure at the opposite side. Explain. To this, Lieutenant Guy spoke. His voice steady, nurse relaxed. Even his fur seemed to have a healthy sheen, as opposed to the usual mess of tangled fluff of one undergoing stress reactions. Patron Lorwa, if I may, he asked, and then produced his own almost identical report on portable combat grade pad, presenting it on a reverse to her, gesturing to the battle map. This shows the newest developments. We have reclaimed 85 star systems, 200 plus gateway lanes, and most of the previously seized territories of the Denai fleet. He then paused. Who are now retreating to the home sector? Then he sat upright, waiting patiently. The Denai fleet, an ancient enemy who knew war like fish knew water, could reliably lose a single planet after protracted ground conflict. A month of star lane engagements and the loss of at least a hundred thousand troops to each side. And even then, the chance existed that they simply poisoned the world before departing, often with a mocking media blitz, hammering home the point of the true cost of war. In reply, Lorwa could only blink, shaking her head, amazed and suspicious. How? And that was when her subordinate simply smiled and replied with a single word. Terrans. The Terrans arrived on the Galactic Collective's attention due to a mismanaged research satellite essentially striking their homeworld and inducing a brief, though productive, dialogue with a nation so aggrieved, resulting in the hastiest of peace treaties. The first reply, before communications could be formally established, was the open declaration of war on anything they could and did immediately detect, and resulted in the destruction of a repair drone fleet a monitoring substation after it evacuated, and a rogue, wandering cluster of Neo-Gato cosmic plant spores nobody had noticed. Suffice to say, Terrans rapidly accrued a reputation as confrontational, if sometimes a little hasty in their judgment. Since the time of full century prior, they have relaxed considerably, now simply regarded as serious, hard-working, industrious, and kind of frightening if provoked. I am... Um, I have no words for the scenario, Lieutenant. Thus, I demand that you supply them. I am likely going to ask for a summary executions, starting with the first fleet commander too slow to outrun me, and I'll be working my way down the command chain until I'm beating your head into a hull plate. Speak fast. At those words, the once sedate Lieutenant's fur became a wild and tangled as she had seen, and this pleased her, inducing such a state in sheer honesty, if fearful, for the following testimony. It had been months since she had a ship captain's head sawn off at the shoulders by junior officers, thus motivating them and their own subordinates to excellence. Uh, um, <clears throat> well, uh, your gloriousness, I must say, the, the Terrans became involved when someone uh, 
uh, as yet unnamed, sent one of the trade ships, the, the, the Graceland, into firing lines of the Denai fleet. Uh, uh, a mistwild report, perhaps, um, or a communications issue. He looked especially nervous at this. After that, the, the Denai did what the Denai do. Um, they engaged the, the new threat, and <clears throat> the, the, since then, uh, the Deterrans have been invading our very field of battle. Space, ground, even planet-side naval engagements. Uh, they, they, um, they don't stop, your gloriousness. They, they, all they do is fight every day, every hour, every moment. War! Again, startlement befell the commander, who squinted less and seemed more disturbed. Did every sapient who engaged in war not have significant period of rest declared at formal onset of engagement? For some, a single day per week. For others, war could last for years, provided the month-long armistice were honored. That the Terrans would behave so recklessly, so violently, as to emit a single most defining characteristic of modern confrontation, it simply boggled the mind. Nay, uh, honor, no date or time, just a uh, non-stop war. This cannot be. She said those words with no small amount of active confusion evident. Her imperious tone, gone. All she had was a single most deranged question she'd considered in her long, long life. Was this all true? Yes, your, your gloriousness. Uh, Terence say, and to verify this, I consulted their own historic records, that this is how they have always done almost all of their wars. No breaks, no pauses, just save for the barest of circumstances. And even then, uh, those moments were sometimes hijacked for military gain. He gulped, shaking his head. They, um, fight like demons, ma'am. As the last word left his maw, he looked even more stricken, and a large patch of his fur adjacent to his neck fell out, lost in the panic response his species had almost forgotten at a genetic level. Fighting back both laughter and terror, the commander gave a dismissive noise, motioning with a clawed finger for the subordinate to ignore the faux pas and continued, M -m 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 many thanks, your gloriousness. Um, to, to elaborate, uh, the, the Terrans also are using sublight transports as weapons more than troop carriers. Um, any vessel that cannot be brought to FTL speeds, they simply pack full of debris, weld the hulls closed, and uh, point them at anything with the deny fleet markings. It's insanity. Yet, they fight for our side, your gloriousness. They find our people, well, um, our value, a term that the fur themselves used when referring to a species that requires elevation, protection, and if needed, avenging. That the Terrans would use their own term to describe the fearsome and mighty fur of the sovereign realms, it transcended insult and entered into the domain of absolute madness. I presume that was a mistranslation, Lieutenant. Do this. The underling could only give a hapless shrug, hopeless in the face of reported facts. No, your grace, um, that's um, how they feel about us. Uh, they that we um, uh, that that we aren't a threat to them, and that uh, we 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 need th this assistance. At that, the commander rose to a full height, blinking in shock, and approached the nearest bulkhead portal, looking through the armored crystal grown onto some backwater hellhole and placed into a hull of her favorite flagship. Seeing not a single vessel of a thousand-plus ships waiting for the next wave of reinforcements, who would not prove necessary? A thing of curiosity, worry, concern. And as she listened to the continued words of her underling, irrelevance. The, um, Terrans say that they'll be done by the time that we can move our fleet into the next position, uh... And that they've sent a cadre to represent them here, and uh, they're waiting outside these chambers. A chunk of Laura's hair fell from her head, lost to the floor's automated cleaners, an event which induced her underling to essentially become bald, sitting in his chair like a hairless rat thing, shaking as the terror that she'd felt then radiated back to him. No wonder he felt so calm, she mused with the devils of hell itself behind him. With that, she turned, looking not at the underling, but the door, and gave the command to open. To this, it did, 
and then entered five tall, broad-chested individuals sealed behind bioplast suits. Their masks concealing their identities, the variance between gas mixtures needed for survival was a large one, and the Terrans seemed content to bring their own atmosphere with them. As one, they did not bow, as was tradition for meeting a commander, but took a knee, as they would with meeting the sovereign themselves. If a hair could rejoin with a body, it would have, and lengthened twice over, such was her amazement. Commander Lorwa, House Absin, Matriarch of the Third, we are honored to be in your presence. May joy find you, and may you find joy. A crisp, formal delivery of the Varian was not of some clunky linguistic module built into their armor. It was that of a studied vocalization, a language which took most cultures upwards of two centuries to absorb enough to teach their own students in, and they spoke it as would clever children or particularly slow teens. And as one, they rose, heads canted to the side, not meeting her gaze, demonstrating further cultural awareness. A move taught to those even glimpsing the sovereign's image. I uh, am honored, and unaware of your names, only your species, which is um, Terence. And as one, the Terence removed the helmets, a set of tubes affixed to their throats, indicating the further treatment that they must have endured surgical or cybernetic enhancement, just to breathe and speak her species atmosphere. Their skins had us for three of the five and the two which bore hair had luxurious, blowing sections of it around their mouths and beneath their nostrils. I am Commander Kilmeray of the First Marines, and I am joined by my subordinates who have elected to be irrelevant for this meeting. The woman who spoke did so with some degree of force in her voice, her chin raised as to do all commanders. Your subordinate by... Um, 11 degrees, was rescued by one of our patrol ships and returned to you. We felt that we should ensure of his continued health and make your acquaintance before returning to the remains of the war. Then she gave a warm, open smile, her teeth concealed, a signal of non-aggression shared amongst most sapient lifeforms. To this, the varying commander motioned for the guests to take seats, which they did, though out of sequence, a forgivable error in protocol. She found her chair remarkably difficult to rejoin, almost stumbling herself, and reclaimed her honor by clearing her throat and motioning to her subordinate, who looked a little less stricken and a little more starstruck. Remains of war, you say? Blora asked, her question spoken as if a minor import. To that, the Terran commander gave a subtle nod. Indeed, your gloriousness, we feel that the engagements to mop up what is left of the Deny homeworld should take us, uh, give or take, around a week. We have a holiday coming up, so we're doubling down to get this done. She then gave a wan, friendly smile, exposing enough teeth to show her species was an omnivore or casual predator, the sign of an equal seeking an equal. Clearly impressed, though unable to stop herself from showing it, Laura spoke her voice a little more strident than intended. I take it you are enlisting the armistice arranged with the denied then. Her tone conveyed a little more hope than she wanted, yet the question stood. To this, the other four Terrans looked at their commander, their eyes speaking whilst their lips did not. In reply, she raised a gloved hand and shook her head, no words spoken. No, ma'am, she said, her tone tersed, but yet not unfriendly. We honor no armistice, the least of all with the deny. They picked a fight. Well, we do have our reply in kind. It's a matter of the ancient ways of our people. Once more, the Ver commander was stunned, though once prepared for the moment and recovered fast. Do all um, Terrans make war with our paws to honor no armistice? And with that, the Terran commander leaned forward, Planting her elbows on the table, looking nowhere except Laura's eyes, her gaze unwavering. They hit us on our biggest species-wide holiday, ma'am. Nobody gets away with that. Ever. Not even once. We don't quit until they're schooled properly. And she smiled, all of those hard, harsh white teeth displayed. A predator's warning. 
To this, Laura replied by leaning in, matching the motion. She could rise to any threat, reply in kind, and feel the fear radiating beyond her. Her command could never be challenged unanswered. She smiled and saw the pupils dilate at every Terran, a fact that she enjoyed. Whilst they may not eject hair in an attempt to dissuade predators from seizing them, the small sign of fearful acknowledgement was a victory enough for her. Then I suppose my newest battle doctrine can use some upgrading. I like learning from the best. Guy, please see to our guests joining us in the strategic planning meeting. Make accommodations for the atmosphere and communications as needed. Without looking, she dismissed her lieutenant, still looking into the commander's eyes. Neither flinching. Your gloriousness, I believe that you are starting to grow on me. I like that you didn't execute that man for the crime of surviving. That kind of thing, uh, it's, um, a step in a righteous direction, ma'am. At that, Loa laughed, slapped the desk and scratched it slightly, her teeth parting enough to show her mirth rather than her rage. He didn't tell me he'd been taken in as a rescue commander, I think, to save his life. Well, you didn't save his life, and he didn't save his life. This war is saving his life. And then she gestured to the ships outside, and raised a chin in pride. Teach me how to never accept a day off, Commander. That's easy, ma'am. A pause. Never forget. At that moment, the ship traveled between her fleet and her window. The hull plates of it adorned in layers of repair modules. Hastily applied armor upgrades and even welded on satellites that must have struck it and proven too difficult to remove. Thus requiring it to be incorporated into the body of the hull. The ship moved into a docking position, and all could see the troops ready to meet with their allies, each of their atmosphere suits bedecked with a unit icon, a single red poppy braced by a pair of elevens in a clear, crisp font. What does that mean, the words in the hull? Is it the ship's name? Her grasp of Terran linguistics was no source of pride for her. To this, standing at her side, Commander Kilmeray spoke. Her voice touched with pride, defiance, and sadness. Poppy Day. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoy.